All right, so let's get started. Um, you guys want to move up a little bit? Test, I won't test. have to do a squint in the eye because of those lights. We don't buy it. All right, I think we have, can we get started? Yeah, good. All right, thank you everyone, good morning. Um, hope you had a good uh, time at the keynotes. Uh, this is our first session of the day, um, along with some parallel tracks, so I appreciate you guys coming here. So the goal for today's session is to talk to our panelists about different delivery models that uh, are emerging because of uh, the maturity of OpenStack, and we can talk about some of the pros and cons of each um, we'll ask our panelists what their opinions are on how this uh, uh, landscape is emerging. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, um, so my name is Ashish Nadkarni. I'm part of IDC's research team, and my job is to look at market trends and track markets and um, you know, size them up. So as, as the tagline goes for IDC, we analyze the future. Um, a lot of people will tell you that OpenStack is one of the ways in which the future of IT is evolving. Um, so we can talk about what those trends are and how we can uh, you know, better, uh, better embrace them. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce our panelists. So I'm going to allow you guys to introduce yourselves. Um, so go ahead, VS. Hello. Hi, my name is VS, VS Joshi. Uh, uh, in the last uh, almost like 12 months, I've had two different and very distinct roles. Initially, for the first six months or so, I was the founder and CEO of a startup, and the startup was doing mobile and social apps. And then in the last six months or so, I have been with EMC, and I have been with uh, a company that is providing solutions for those app developers, solutions uh, that will help them uh, develop the modern apps and things like that. So that is a dual kind of role that I have played in the last one year or so, and I will forward to Cody. Excellent. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Cody Hill, and I'm with uh, Platform 9. I'm a systems engineer, and uh, very similar in the last six months, uh, multiple roles. Um, I was formerly the lead cloud architect at General Electric, uh, supporting a pretty large private cloud there. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Gershater, I'm at Red Hat for nearly three years. As you well know, we have monetized OpenStack and um, open source across many products. I'm in the uh, competitive marketing group there for OpenStack and Telco. Excellent. And thank you again. Um, I know some others have joined since um, the introduction. Um, I have the audience mic, so if you have any questions as we get into the panel, raise your hand and I'll walk to you. Um, you know, I, I, we only have 40 minutes, so I don't want to hold all the questions till the end. Um, you know, as we go into the panel, uh, if you have any questions that you be believe are important to get answered, uh, let's jump right in. So let me um, kind of turn to the panel. Uh, VS, I want to start with you. Um, I'm intrigued by your dual role, your app, app, app dev perspective. So tell us a little bit more about how you see this whole OpenStack ecosystem from an application developer's perspective. Okay. So it was a dual role, but a dual serial role. The first role was of an application developer. And you know, as an application developer, the things that we need are we need infrastructure that is available instantaneously. That is number one. We need infrastructure that is going to scale up and down. We need infrastructure that will allow us to start small and then grow big. We need the ability to uh, do frequent changes. So those are the kind of needs. We need the application to be resilient. So those are the kind of things we are expecting out of the infrastructure service provider, right? And think, I mean, again, I haven't talk, talk, talked about OpenStack at all as yet. And these things can be provided by the public cloud or they can be provided by the private cloud or by the internal IT departments as such. Within public cloud, OK, we can go to AWS or we can go to Rackspace for OpenStack. I mean, for us, we went with Rackspace, not because they had OpenStack per se. 
we went to Rackspace because they check box. I mean, they check marked each and every of those needs that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. So OpenStack is definitely one of the ways for people to reach there to get that kind of uh, uh, infrastructure for their applications. Yeah. Excellent. So yeah, go ahead, Jonathan. Sure. Thanks. I I can echo your point because I think. Many enterprises, when they look at OpenStack, they need to realize that it's part of their overall cloud solution. So you use OpenStack for your infrastructure. You need storage. You need a cloud management solution. You need a platform as a service for the application development. And you can use cloud management as well to broker between private and public mm -hmm. clouds. So I think the main message is op people need to realize that OpenStack is not the only part of your overall cloud solution. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Cody, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think they're both spot on. Um, yeah, so a hybrid cloud strategy is very, you know, very good. Even even getting down to some uh, businesses needing things like Ironic in the OpenStack product to, to provision bare metal and things like that. So, um, you know, bare metal virtualization on prem, public cloud off prem, even a colo, right? You need to be looking at all these things when you look at a cloud solution. And definitely at containers, right? Containers, yeah. yeah. Yep. So I'm going to do a bit of a role play here. So VS just hired his infrastructure guy. Now, the three of you are going to have to s talk about your value proposition of you know, your, in your OpenStack distributions, or the pros and cons of what OpenStack distributions they should be looking at, what kind of infrastructure they should be looking at. So Jonathan, why don't I start with you? And, and you can talk about some of the um, you know, the different delivery models and what you believe are the pros and cons, and then we can go in that order. Okay, so you can certainly deploy OpenStack in your own private cloud on your own hardware. You can get it from a provider such as Rackspace where the Red Hat solution is available. You can get it from, um, you know, some com companies offer a appliance model. And wh whichever the ones you're looking at, What's needed, uh, I think most enterprises, as we've seen this morning with the Gartner keynote, is uh, OpenStack is reaching enterprise adoption. And the enterprise wants stability, they want security, and they want interoperability. In OpenStack was to bring this nirvana of removing vendor lock-in. So they want to be able to interoperate with many hardware providers, many neutron networking providers, many uh, storage providers. Mm -hmm. Cody, what's the, I'm sorry, we, uh, did you have anything? Um, yeah, so um, I, I think to add to that is that um, some of the things you need to look at when looking for um, an enterprise grade OpenStack solution is utilizing the hardware that you've already invested in, mm -hmm. right? How, how do you turn that existing virtualization stack that you already have into a full fledged private cloud with OpenStack APIs? Um, and give you the choice of hypervisor, right? Do you want vSphere, do you want KVM, you're right? Let, let the IT shop choose the hypervisor that they want to use. And, and then you have to think further down the road. It's not just, hey, I, I want to be on Liberty today or Mataka next week, right? It's how do I get there, right? H how do you get from one version of OpenStack to the other? How do we keep it highly available? How do you troubleshoot it, patch it, monitor, maintain that distribution? You, you need, um, you know, uh, there was a talk at one of the other summits about the six PhD problem with OpenStack, right? You need six PhDs to run it. And uh, I think, uh, you know, we can do better. Mm -hmm. So, so let, me, let, me, let me step back for a moment here, yeah? Uh, let's go to the very basics as such, in the sense that uh, what, what are the various OpenStack deployment models, yeah? So number one is, okay, fine, I can go with a public cloud offering like Rackspace, and from them I can get OpenStack, yeah? And I go to Open, as opposed to Amazon, I go to Rackspace and I go to OpenStack because, yes, it has the API, uh, API-based services, number one. It has the, the community support and the, these kind of summits and things like that. And yes, there are people who have gone through this thing before, and you find these people all over the world. And they have a lot of tools like the SDKs, APIs, and uh, CLIs, and all those kind of things. So that is the reason why you come over here. But now, when you go to private cloud, when you go to private cloud, there are, again, three, four options that open up. One is you can build it yourself. You said, OK, I go to openstat.org, and I can just download the software, and I can build it myself. That is one way of going about it. The second way of going about it is, yes, what Red Hat, Mirantis, and Canonical does. They provide a software for these uh, folks, and they essentially support that thing. So that is the second way of going about it. 
And the third way of going about it is OpenStack in a box. You can call it as an appliance, you can call it as a rack, you can call it as an OpenStack powered rack or whatever it is. So, and that OpenStack, OpenStack powered rack or OpenStack powered appliance, so that is like uh, OpenStack in a box where the vendors, they have gone through the trouble of making all these hundreds of decisions that you as a do-it-yourself person has to go through. And they have done those things, they have certain view, and they have put that views into that product, and they are giving the product to you. So that is the way I look at it. And from the company standpoint, I think your question was, how do you, what do you talk about your solution? So from our company standpoint, we, we feel that the customer has a spectrum of needs. They can go either of these routes, and whichever their route they choose. And they choose their route based upon what they're most comfortable with. If suppose somebody is most comfortable with do-it-yourself, yes, EMC has all the hardware gear, and we have all the uh, drivers and things like that by which our hardware will work with all the things that you have. If you want to go with uh, the software model, yes, we partner with Mirantis, we partner with Red Hat, and we partner with Canonical. And yes, if in case you want to come up with an appliance, we are launching something next week, not this week, but next week at EMC World. So that is another route to go through. So again, uh, I will not pick one versus the other. I would say that we meet the customer in their journey and what, at whatever stage the customer is at, yeah? Mm -hmm. And I'd like to add, there's uh, one deployment model that uh, was kind of left out, and that's um, the OpenStack as a service with your hardware on-prem. Uh, a managed OpenStack, yes. um, and so that's and I know because that's that's what Platform Nine delivers, right? So you have your OpenStack in the cloud, and you bring your own hardware inside your private data center, and you can wire that up, and then all the maintenance and all of that's handled at, at the uh, service level. But isn't Cisco Metapod also do this, does the same thing? Cisco Metapod uh, requires you to buy um, a, an appliance. Basically, you have to buy their hardware, uh -huh. um, and you need to l allow the um, them access to the data center to do the upgrades and the maintenance and all of that. So this is kind of decoupling that, right? Enterprises have tackled virtualization. They understand how to um, upgrade vSphere, or upgrade their Linux host from KVM, right? And they, but they don't know how to up upgrade OpenStack and troubleshoot it and check out RabbitMQ and figure out all these nasty things, right? But virtualization, enterprises have solved. So that's, that's where the line of demarcation is. And then we host the OpenStack control plane for them. And, and that. So I think that's the beauty yeah, of OpenStack is that you have this upstream project where all these different vendors and delivery models should be adhering to. And one of the things you want to look for whenever you're doing that is a solution that is most adherent to that upstream so that changes that are made upstream can flow down to the distribution or the version of OpenStack that you're using. And that I think is a very important factor to consider for especially companies that are a little more leading edge or want the newer features or, is, for example, telcos are a big use case for network function virtualization and they'll want something like IPv6 pushed in upstream and then have that supported by a vendor. So you want to look for a vendor that has also upstream uh, influence to get those changes pushed in and then supported. So that's an excellent point and we'll get back to the whole community contributions. But Cody, I want to go back to you and um, kind of touch upon something you mentioned earlier and just now. Um, it, it, a lot of times we get questions as if, op uh, so OpenStack is not always a greenfield, de greenfield deployment. And I think what you're saying is that the way you deliver or offer OpenStack as a service, you can almost make full use of your existing investments. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, with our product, what you're able to do is um, for if you have an existing VMware deployment, you deploy an appliance, and not only do we wire up um, the, those vSphere clusters to be um, you know, used as Nova compute drivers, but we also ingest all of your existing networks, vSphere templates, virtual machines as OpenStack objects. So you're not managing a legacy cloud and then moving forward. Um, and we do the same thing with KVM, right? If you have a KVM environment, all of your bridges that you've been using with KVM come in as OpenStack networks. All of the instances running in KVM come in, and any QCOW2 images you have also come in as OpenStack images. So we automatically ingest all of those um, and then allow you to just run and, and maintain one di distribution. So yeah, I completely agree because companies that have grown over years have many different vendors in their data center. They have various Linuxes, they have various hardware vendors over time. So just as you're saying, if you already have an existing virtualization platform, if you have a good cloud management solution that can 
manage your VMware and your uh, Red Hat virtualization and your OpenStack and your public cloud, et cetera, you can embrace all of those technologies under one platform. And there are open hybrid cloud solutions such as the one we offer called CloudForm that allows you to add an existing open stack on the side into your other solutions. That's good to know. And so going back to UVS, um, in the context of the different delivery models and the choice you mentioned, how does um, ex the use of existing resources, your existing investments in infrastructure, play into the, the choice that you, uh, that you talked about? Um, could you elaborate the, uh, on that a little bit uh, in, in the sense that it would seem like it's a similar pattern to storage resources, right, or storage infrastructure? you use storage virtualization to make most of existing storage resources, but you buy a brand new storage array as a green field, almost like a replacement to your existing resources. Is there a similar model there? In an appliance model, I think everything kind of comes together. I mean, the vendor has thought of all these things. They have put their own kind of storage uh, devices, compute devices, and things like that. They have packaged it, they've pre-tested it, pre-validated it, and that's the thing that comes to your, uh, on your site. And yes, because they have done all these things, uh, you don't have to go through 500 decisions that you will have to go through. So as far as that existing uh, existing uh, infrastructure that you have, yes, you can use it for the other models, for the do-it-yourself model, and f for those things you can use because yes, you can get the drivers and things like that and you can make it uh, more uh, working with OpenStack as such. But as far as the appliance is concerned, yes, you will get the whole thing packaged uh, and pre-tested and pre-validated uh, at your doorstep. So is there a way to have the appliance sit side by side an existing um, kind of a DIY or a software-based OpenStack deployment? Do you believe that there is a way for both of these to sit side by side and for someone to make use of an orchestration layer at a higher level to um, you know, use both site types of infrastructure? Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, sure. Do you guys want to elaborate on that or talk about that a little bit? Um, we, we have quite a few customers that are using some of the hyper-converged stacks, uh, such as Nutanix and stuff like that. So um, if you're coming for the appliance model, right, Nutanix works great with VMware and vSphere. Um, their KVM isn't full-fledged open KVM, right? So there are some issues integrating You're talking there. about Acropolis? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, we do see that. And then, um, you know, th there's always ways to do, you know, things through Keystone integrations with multiple regions and stuff like that. So you can keep your, um, you know, your appliance that you just bought, your brand new shiny appliance. And then, you know, if you brought in something like, uh, you know, roll your own or, you know, uh, a managed OpenStack solution for the legacy, um, you can always do like a Keystone integration or something like that. So you could have them running in multiple regions. So you can manage them in the same location, right? Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question on the appliance model. Doesn't it, if, if OpenStack is supposed to be, uh, the goal um, is I think you need to hold your mic. If open, the goal, one of the goals of OpenStack <laughs> is to have more uh, vendor agnostic or uh, will enable you to use white box hardware. Doesn't the appliance model bring back a little bit more lock-in, like you locked into this box of servers, and every time you want to scale, you have to buy a whole another appliance versus just buying some few servers or racks of more standard x86? I think it's a, it's a, it's a good point. Yeah, the, here's the thing. Uh, it depends upon the customer. So if you have customers like CERN or AT&T, Yahoo, PayPal, eBay, for these customers, they are not ever going to go with the appliance model because they want customization. They want tremendous customization. They want customization to an nth degree. So they are not going to go with these things. But then when you come to enterprises, for the enterprise folks, they don't have the, they don't, finding the talent that can do this thing. I mean, you know, OpenStack as such is a very complex thing. There are 20 plus projects and there are 20 million plus lines of code that is written over there, okay? The person has to go through hundreds of decisions as such. Assembling the stack is a problem. After you assemble the stack, maintaining the stack is a problem. The enterprise guy over there, he wants the whole damn thing to run. That's what he wants. He, he has all the, the VM related expertise as you mentioned earlier, he has that thing. What he doesn't have is somebody who can understand Python, who has written something in Python. So what he doesn't have is, so, so those are the things for which are the hardware expertise. So for that, they would say for an enterprise of certain size from, uh, let's say an enterprise who, who have the capacity of half a rack to 10 rack, for those folks uh, having somebody already figured out all these pain points, already have a certain view and they are coming, 
uh, with, uh, with a solution, that is the best way to go for them. And that, that, that's where I would kind of differ in the sense that, yes, there are some companies like CERN and AT&T, Yahoo, yes, they will go for customization and they will need uh, OpenStack and they will not go for the appliance model. But there are, at the enterprise level, enterprise need these things to be hardened. You know, a, a enterprise need, I mean, they don't want somebody from their IT department to build the cloud and, but then, gee, what happens if that guy leaves? Uh, who's going so, to take care of these things? So, so I mean, you have yeah. vendors with so supported solutions and professional, professional services that are going to help you get you through your journey. You know, you know, the goal is not to go out and hire 100 expensive Python engineers, but get a solution that is well supported, very secure, very stable. So that will so still be able to I, use I, I, white box hardware. So this is a good lead in to the, my next set of questions, which is resources. And I think we are on our sixth. Question. Oh, there's a question. Michael Dells with American Airlines. Well, one of the things you guys, because I am an enterprise, I'm Fortune 100, um, and when you say enterprise, you kind of have someone to offend me, because uh, you sound like you, all enterprises are identical. But one of the things I think you're, <laughs> you're not quite addressing is the business really doesn't care about us creating OpenStack. The business wants to have a great way for them to deploy applications. So. For me, one of the big challenges of a box solution or a distribution or doing it yourself is to make sure that the vision is to include something like Cloud Foundry or Docker integration or containerization type of um, processes, but that also have the linkage to be SOX compliant, PCI compliant, HIPAA compliant, be able to think, because there's Oracle pays their salespeople really well, so Oracle Exadata, Exalogix, all those kind of things that are really big boxes that maybe in the future will be OpenStack enabled and they kind of talk about it, um, but the current product doesn't do that. So that's what, for me, is the big thing, is to figure out if I'm a really small company and I can totally live in a box and I don't have to worry about legacy integration, no big deal. For the rest of the enterprises, though, this is not going to be the entire ecosystem, and I need to make that sure that ecosystem works with the rest of my ecosystem, which needs to work at a higher level, not just at um, a VM type of um, construct. Yeah, that was exactly That's an excellent question. Thank you. Yeah, exactly yeah. my opening point is OpenStack is a sliver. It's a part of your entire strategy. And people shouldn't think of it as the be-all and end-all. You have public cloud, you have existing virtualization on, uh, on various platforms, and you want an entire solution, including your pairs, be it you know, OpenShift or Cloud Foundry or whoever, that should be open and be integrated. Right. Yeah, and I think you made a great point. Um, you know, I, Formerly, I worked at General Electric, lead cloud architect, so understand the size of Fortune 100 or even Fortune 10, right? Um, as well as all of the compliance, right? With GE Healthcare, we had HIPAA, you know, with uh, GE Capital, we had SOX and aviation, and we have all of these different regulatory requirements. So, um, you know, totally under understand that model. And there are, th you know, the, the, the issue that we had with uh, bringing in the appliance, like, uh, and it wasn't um, your appliance, it was, uh, um, at the time, we were looking at um, Nutanix and, and different types of things just to make our lives easier. And the issue is is that we have already validated that we use this vendor for this type of hardware. And if we change that, we have to change all of our documentation. right? And we have to use this hypervisor vendor because we already made that decision, compliance signed off, and we're done. We have to use that. Right. Um, so those are the things that we had to take into account when we started building an OpenStack distribution. So we had to use that hardware, that hypervisor, that storage. Right. And sure. we needed a, a layer that can do all of that for us. It's the ecosystem. Yeah. So, so I would like VS to respond and then yeah, I'll yeah, take sure. a question. So, so go ahead. The, what you're looking for is multi-services. You want multi-services from the same box. Yeah. Uh, what I would like to request to you is you should come to the EMC booth and see the system that we have over there, okay? That is exactly what we are trying to go towards, that yes, this is a box, and yes, to start with, we will have the uh, OpenStack-based IaaS on it, but yes, if you want pass, you'll have pass. If you want big data, you'll have big data. So the same system can be leveraged for various use cases. So it kind of, uh, I mean, thanks for the question. I appreciate that, yeah. Hi, um, Alex from uh, America Marvel, Brazil. Uh, I would like to share um, a little bit of our experience down there in Brazil uh, regarding not only appliances but also the distributions. Uh, I would say that you know the the talk about appliances uh, definitely we're heading to that, but I I see I I believe that we are a little bit. Uh, uh, um, 
uh, later when it comes to uh, distributions and a different uh, hardware models. Just to mention one of the issues that we face it uh, with a particular uh, distribution that didn't support uh, hyperconvergent infrastructure, meaning we couldn't run VMs with our uh, 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 storage, and we uh, and we needed to do that. And if you look at the the marketplace, you're going to take Canonical Distro, Head Head, uh, or Mirantis they uh, uh, taking even the, the same uh, uh, release, for example, Kilo, the differences between what is supported in terms of uh, hardware, uh, and not, not mention you know, uh, um, uh, certification matrix, I, I mentioned basic architectural decisions such as going with this uh, separated storage or uh, uh, hyperconvergent. Uh, we are still very uh, immature in terms of what OpenStack from the vendors is supported or not. To make a long story short, we decided to go with the vanilla, meaning we, uh, we are deploying ourselves, and it requires lots of efforts. The, the, you know, there's no OpenStack uh, developers available all over the place, but it proved to be uh, the best way to go. Uh, because you don't have, uh, you know, uh, heterogeneous, I mean, uh, uh, homogeneous uh, uh, support for hardware and stuff. And Thank you. And I think, so Red Hat That's has had a similar, I mean, you've Michael? gone through this process, right? So, I, you know, Jonathan, sure, sure. if you One thing to remember. Uh, yeah, I think they shut the mic off, so. Oh, did the mic, no? Yeah, so, so one of the things that, um, I just wanted to, to ask, um, and he doesn't have a mic anymore, but that's okay. Um, no, but I just wanted to know, so with having a hard time hiring engineers and building a vanilla OpenStack, um, what is, what, what's your plan to move off of Kilo? Um, you know, and uh, what are you doing for a maybe legacy, um, legacy infrastructure that you already had virtualization on? What are your plans for these things? I'm just, I'm curious from a, a yeah, business yeah. point of view. Uh, basically, what we are doing, and, and um, we do have both VMware, I mean, we have a bunch of vBlocks. Can you imagine the vBlocks, a uh, bunch of uh, isolated VMware deployments? Uh, we decided to go you know, from scratch. We're doing that. And from Kilo to Liberty or, or whatever, uh, um, we are evaluating, to be honest with you, our current distribution was uh, upgraded from uh, from Hat Hat to uh, RDO, uh, and the developers. I'm not a, 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 a not a, a tag guy, but uh, they're doing, and uh, we will support. I mean, we will be supported by developers, and we, we joke. I mean, I joke that uh, our main developer he needs to leave at our the building. He needs to ask for permission to leave the building, go home, and etc. So. Uh, that's how we were working. It's a very risky situation, and uh, but honestly, the experiences that we have with uh, distributions was not a, a good thing. And and, yeah. and we're running, but you never know. Yeah. So d um, that that's exactly why Platform Nine was founded. Thank you. And so that's um, you know th this situation where you have your hyperconverged infrastructure. He mentioned VBlock, right, running on top of VMware. Um, and not having a, a team of people to be able to manage this, right? If his engineer gets hit by a bus, their whole business is down, right? I hope that doesn't happen. Um, and, and so those are the things that I think a lot of enterprises, right? You guys are here to learn about how to deploy OpenStack. And, and some of the things you need to look forward is how do we maintain this? How do we make sure that we can upgrade it? How can we patch it? How can we troubleshoot it? Um, and having one engineer that has to ask permission to go to the bathroom is, uh, you know, maybe not the best uh, idea. <laughs> so we have a question here, and just wanted to uh, do a quick time check. We have around 10 minutes, but this is your panel in the sense, please feel free to ask questions. Um, I do want to talk about uh, resources and how, you know, how many resources do you need to manage OpenStack, and I think you touched upon it, Cody. I just want to ask yeah. him on uh, Mr. Alexon from America Mobile on the hardware certified matrix. What's important to remember is OpenStack is not running on the hardware. There's something underneath it called a host Linux. And we want to look for a Linux distro that has a wide variety of certified hardware and has been a Linux distro that has been around for a long time with an ecosystem of certified hardware. And that, that is a very important thing to remember when selecting that um, OpenStack distro is what is the Linux that's running underneath it. And additionally, does that Linux have security certifications? So for example, the RHEL Linux has common criteria and FIPS and various other 
um, certifications from the U.S. government that's, be, you know, 20 years in existence. Does this, you say that also applies to Pite and Canonical? We, we can certainly I have would. that discussion. Uh, yes, I, I would say that would apply. Uh, yeah, we can debate uh, certifications, but let's get to the question. Hey, my name is Marcus from Demand Media. Um, so we're in kind of the same boat as uh, the gentleman over there. Um, we're trying to adopt OpenStack uh, early on stages, uh, but the way we decided to go about doing it is more of a cautious, more uh, uh, more cautious way. Uh, we're using MetaCloud at the point, at the current point, but the early stage of MetaCloud, so not the whole Metapod thing, uh, on our own gear. But with the end goal of running OpenStack on our own, the DIY type solution, side by side with it, if you guys had to give us just one piece of advice from each of you, what would you um, see as the biggest recommendation or, or advice from going from using Metapod, Metapod currently and then building a DIY on the side on our own, just trying to learn it and understand it at the same time? I think the one advice I can give you is find a friend who has done this thing before. Uh, I thank thank you. That's an excellent question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would highly recommend um, making sure you have a deep talent pool to to help you do that. Right, start hiring and start hiring now. If you want to run OpenStack on your own um, with Vanilla, you definitely need. You know, it, it's doable. You know, there's a lot of companies doing it very successfully, but they have amazing engineers working for them. So just start hiring. Yeah, I think it leads into your uh, question you're going to ask on resources, mm -hmm. and there are many cost benefits to hiring on your own versus paying a vendor to support it for you. And the resource constraint is really something you need to take into account. And there are several, sorry to use the term, graveyards of failed deployments where companies try to go on their own and eventually had to come to vendors. So I'm going to throw this back at you guys. And you all three have come from different backgrounds, different suppliers. Um, how do you address the resources gap? You know, today, you know, the, there is a, a big disparity between, say, what American Airlines would need to deploy versus um, the, the gentleman there. Uh, uh, American Mobile. Yeah. Um, how do you address it? I mean, is it education? Is it training programs? Certification? Um, you know, documentation? I'd love to hear your uh, comments on how, how you would, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, the, the way that we address it is we use you know a managed OpenStack solution. So we host the control plane decoupled from your hardware. Um, enterprises today don't have an issue with virtualization, like I mentioned before. They know how to maintain and manage that. Um, and so we we upgrade the distribution, we patch it, we monitor it, we troubleshoot it. If if they try to provision an instance and it throws an error, our engineers reach out to them and say, Hey, what's going on? Looks like your storage is full, right? So we have an army of engineers that are on our operations team that handles this for you as a managed service so that you really can just you know, run your business, do your thing, and we handle that. Mm -hmm. So again, um, that is the reason why this whole appliance model exists, right? Because yes, the talent pool is not available. And again, it's very simple, guys. The thing is, you know, we are in the month of April. We just did our taxes. Some of you did the taxes by themselves. You used the DIY method. Some people got the TurboTax uh, software and did it by the, uh, again, so you got the reference architecture from TurboTax, yeah? And some people were, you know, I wanna, don't want to do anything. You went to h and and you said, okay, do my taxes. And they, again, so I would say that, okay, that is the way it is going to continue. Now you have to define as to what is it, what is your core competency? Is your core competency about uh, installing this open stack and maintaining this open stack. And yes, there are some people who love to do that. And yes, go ahead. I mean, that is what you will do. Uh, and But there are some people for whom the velocity is the key. Velocity is the key. And because velocity is the key, they will build what they must and they will buy what they can. And there's where the whole uh, appliance thing comes into picture. Yeah, I agree on core competency. So obviously our model is that we curate and QA and test the code extensively after we have made many contributions upstream. So what you get is a solid product and with it professional services to help you deploy and to train your staff. All right, so Derek with uh, SolidFire now NetApp. Um, so a question for all three of you, if you can give me kind of three reasons a piece of why do you think some of the appliance models for OpenStack have failed? Um, specifically, if you want to reference one, uh, someone like Nebula. That's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know about the three per, though. That's, yeah. that's nine of so in total. 
Personally, I think Nebula was a, a fantastic thing, but it, it was just too early. I, I think that's why Nebula failed, right? They came into the market too early. They were ha trying to beat down the door and try to push something. Um, and and I think with an appliance model, you much you have a much higher burn rate when it comes to a startup. I think that's why they failed. If they would have uh, come in as a, a software layer, um, they might not have grown as quick. They got popular, people knew them, but they just, they burned through money. And I think that was kind of their problem, but um, no, those guys at Nebula were smart guys. Yeah, I have first-hand uh, knowledge on that. So JPL is a customer of ours that we released this morning, are running on our stack, and they started with Nebula from Chris Kemp. They came out of NASA, and the, s the, I, the story that we are aware of is that they were taking OpenStack bits from various distros, so from upstream, from some from Icehouse, some from Havana, and a Linux kernel from here and there, and code from here, and trying to get that all together to work proved very daunting. And what they li liked about our model is that we have the solid Linux and the curated um, upstream OpenStack co-engineered together, and it's working great for them. It was released today. So I think as far as Nebula is concerned, the pedigree of the founders was absolutely not in question. They had the best founder, the person who kind of started this whole thing can be considered as the founding father of uh, the whole OpenStack movement as such, yeah? Uh, and again, I agree with Cody that yes, uh, they were a bit ahead of the time, I guess, in the sense that the surrounding market or the ecosystem had mat not matured to a level where a startup can sustain that kind of, you know, because a startup, they, they are going out of cash. And the, ma the market has to mature before they go out of cash. And somehow that thing didn't happen in this particular case. But because otherwise, everything was fabulous, right? I mean, th that's, that's all I can say. I mean, just adding more to what Cody mentioned. Thank you. Uh, we have one question, and I'd like to give you time to do offer cl closing comments. Hi, I'm Alka Deshpande from uh, Oracle Corporation. Uh, one thing you mentioned is to some, uh, some customers are doing this. Uh, pulling uh, various features from various releases of OpenStack, and that is a total, um, totally wrong. Wouldn't you say that? Pulling items, uh, you know, some features from various, uh, various releases of OpenStack. ISOs, Juno, Kilo. Yeah, yeah. When you're doing a, uh -huh. this was an experience at NASA JPL when they were right. doing the DIY model. Is they're pulling directly from upstream to the the, the code has not been extensively QA'd and right. tested with hardware mm -hmm. and tested with Linux, so they ran into these problems. So, so any advice on um, how many uh, releases are well supported? Or say, say I deliver something in Mitaka, and then can I backport it to um, the previous release, Kilo and Juno? T only two releases backports are allowed, is that right? So For what, open you do stack, main, main what you're doing upstream, on your own is really up to you. If you're getting it from a vendor, then mm -hmm. they will have a support cycle. So for example, our support cycle is three years, mm -hmm. and other vendors will have, have their own. So this is not a question about a particular vendor, but rather OpenStack question. I don't know if you guys are qualified to say that. Uh. Um, so I think the way I would sort of rephrase the question is I think she's talking about uh, the um, sort of the a la carte approach where you do have the ability to pull things, push things. Um, with the Linux uh, background, I think, Jonathan, maybe you can offer something about how Red Hat has managed that in a sort of a, um, sort of the, the, the cadence and the discipline around it. Do you want to offer that? And sure. So yeah, so as people are well aware, we've monetized and run o open source software for 20 years. So we are very well versed in, in running uh, RHEL. And now you take OpenStack and you run it on RHEL. And you co-engineer the two together because OpenStack relies on drivers mm -hmm. to talk to the hardware, to talk to the networking, to talk to the storage. So when you curate and you co-engineer the two together, you come with a, a very solid and secure and uh, QA'd solution. Cool. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, and I think to, to your point, um, it's n not always a bad thing to pull something from Mataka if it solves your problem. But you need to QA it. You need to test it before you roll it, right? So you know. At, um, in, in our organization, we've we've pulled stuff from, uh, you, you know, hey, we, we just had a bug filed, and that bug was fixed in Mataka. Well, we're not on Mataka yet, but hey, let's pull down that code, let's put it in our environment, let's QA it, let's test it, let's see what's going on. Um, so I, I think it's okay to do. 
So I, I think the hope is, and at least with, with uh, our platform, is that we will then be upgrading to Mataka, and that bug fix is then fixed. So yes, you will be upgrading your distro, um, but if you're trying to maintain a Grizzly release with some Mataka patches, it's not a good idea. Yeah, so, so, so I, with that, we are almost out of time. So I'd like to offer each of you the sort of you can, your closing comments and you know, what, what words of advice would you offer to users, current and potential of so, OpenStack? Thank you for the opportunity to be on the panel. I've enjoyed it and had the opportunity to answer the questions. Um, certainly welcome to go on your own if that's your preferred approach. If you want to use a hosted solution, um, that should be open and willing to do that. If you want to run it in your own uh, data center, then you want to really look for a solution that is solidly QA'd and tested across a wide variety of hardware and software platforms that form an ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I would I would mimic that uh, same deal. I, I think you know we we have a lot of distributions running on Red Hat. We love that we have Red Hat. We love uh, Ubuntu, um, VMware. If you're a VMware shop, right? If you need to choose what fits you the best, and don't forget about legacy IT because you you don't want to build. And this is an issue that I learned firsthand at GE is you don't want to build siloed teams to take care of different stacks of infrastructure, where you have a cloud team that's using virtual virtualization, then you have a legacy virtualization team. Um, so if you're going to build your team to, to run your cloud moving forward, combine the teams, run it together, and do that. Um, and, and so and, and one of the things that we're doing to prove how open, so OpenStack has gotten a lot of black eyes, that it's, it's difficult, it's hard, I can't, I can't run it, right? So one of the things that we're doing to prove that OpenStack can be easy is that we, we could run it for you, right? And you can download a free trial of our software and do all that, or we put OpenStack on a stick. Right, so stop by the booth, get OpenStack on the stick, and see how easy OpenStack can be. All right, yes, okay. thank you. Uh, so, couple of things. Uh, number one is velocity is the key. Second thing is your core competency. If your core competency, and if your core competency is about building it, then yes, fine, go with that particular route. But uh, if velocity is the key, yes, Build whatever you must, but buy whatever you can. And uh, uh, finally, you know, when we say free software and things like that, just remember one thing. There's a difference between free beer and free puppy. F free puppy, you'll get a free puppy, but then you'll have to maintain, you'll have to take care of the puppy and things like that. Yeah. So with that thought, I think I should close. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank my, our panelists here, and uh, thank you all for uh, hanging in there. Uh, and thank you for the great questions. Uh, have a great uh, time at the summit. <laughs>